Miggity Mike, Miggity Mike, Mike, Miggity Mike, Miggity Mike, Mike Check One Two. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host Agostino. This is episode number one three four uno tres cuatro. What's going on, mi hombres? Eh? What's going on, mi mamacitas, mi chicos, mi chicas? What's happening, friends and people that I might know and do know? Hope you guys are doing well on this nice, sunny, sunny, sunny Friday morning. It's I, your friend, Agostino, or somebody you wish you never knew, Agostino, or somebody that you wish you knew, but you kind of don't because no one really knows who I am. We're not going to start on an emo mode. On an emo mode. We're going to get on cracking on, in, out, in, out, on, because my body and my um, limbs are aching, number one, and number two, severely cold, severely, severely cold. Right about now, we're heading into the the um, the week just before Christmas, and usually, you know, this kind of season is bitterly, bitterly cold in London, and it's not as cold as it could be. You know, um, I know previous years have been a bit slushy. We've had that kind of snow that only appears in places like London, Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle, Edinburgh, and Glasgow, where it's not as much snow, and it's more so a mixture of ice particles and people's dirt on the bottom of their shoes. So it's not the most ent- it's not the most um, entertaining, or it doesn't kind of um, remember it doesn't remind you of like old school Disney movies or anything. If anything, it just reminds you of post apocalyptic nation that's just been attacked by a foreign power um so that hasn't happened so far that's been the only saving grace so when i go outside when i'm going running or if i'm popping out to do something i'm not necessarily having to mind my steps and make sure that i don't slip and smash my skull against a concrete floor that's been great that's been amazing and awesome don't get me wrong but besides all of that good fortune is still bitterly bitterly cold it's the kind of cold where when i go out for a run usually you know when you're running and you're doing some sort of cardiovascular work or you're moving your body in some sort of you know rhythmic tempo that informs that you know that kind of relates to you trying to fall over but then you're running at the same time usually what happens is that all that cardiovascular work that you're doing ends up heating up your bodily system in some way shape or form but when it's cold as it is outside now oh there's that song in it baby it's cold outside remember that song that's been banned on the radio station somewhere fucking ridiculous i don't care not talking about that right now because i'm not sjw warrior but regardless of that there's it's so bitterly cold outside that even if you run for a good five to ten minutes consistently and you're keeping a good tempo and you're hoping you're going you know the sweat and the perspiration that's coming out of your body is somehow gonna allow you to get heated up think again it's too cold the moment i like stop to let a car go past me or i'm crossing the road or whatever just any kind of change in tempo automatically you feel the cold snapping inside of you and um, even more so during my runs because I'm not necessarily run- the only things that I'm wearing that are like dry fit I think is the shirt that I have inside and my uh, trousers for instance I got these like running these Nike running trousers kind of things right so those are the only things that are kind of dry fit so in- essentially they, they aren't going to keep you as warm as they should be because you know the whole premise of dry fit is that it's wicking off the sweat from your skin onto the outside of the of the garment so you're not necessarily it's not necessarily keeping it in like a black bin bag but I do have a jacket i wear like an old nike windbreaker that isn't dry fit hasn't got any sort of perspiration um or ventilation holes inside of it so it does kind of keep sweat locked inside of it for the most part so i kind of use it as a weird sort of like sweat thing mechanism like in terms of wearing a black bin bag and even that doesn't work either so it's just generally cold as fuck um unfortunately so but um i still get it in as per usual today is the fifth day in a row that I've been outside running in some sort of capacity and I have to admit my body is maybe breaking down slightly I feel very sore everywhere um uh, especially because I went gym as well yesterday I ended up going gym and doing loads of like kettlebell work and loads of and I did like about I think did probably a thousand 1200 meters on the rowing machine I think I did three yeah three sets of 400 um, including uh, 10 press-ups in between, or 10 press-ups each set. So I did, well, 400 meters followed by 10 press-ups uh, for three for free sets or free reps, whatever, I don't know. These resets and reps, I'm always shit at counting stuff. That's why I always take a screenshot of the workouts, just make sure I look at it once, or uh, once or twice I'm in the gym, that's it. I'm not really know how to count well. Um, so my abdomen is absolutely crushed from doing a row machine, which is good because that means I might get a six-pack one of these days. Um, but in general, my arms are fucking shot. 
my yeah, my biceps are short from doing curls and doing kettlebell stuff and overhead presses and all that malarkey. My legs are completely short from running all around the place. So yeah, man, my body is aching. My mind is fresh. And today is another day. Here comes a podcast. Um, that didn't rhyme, but hey, you know what I mean? Like I'm one of those avant-garde uh, contemporary poets that doesn't necessarily rhyme things and just puts words together in the hope that you're going to get sparked with inspiration from the words that I place on the canvas. Who knows? Who fucking knows? Anyway, we're we're here, we're here, another episode one one three four. Um yeah, Christmas is coming up, innit? I've mentioned before I don't really give a shit about Christmas. I think um in general. Um, I've kind of been conditioned not to give a shit about it. If I'm kind of, if I, if I want to psychoanalyze myself, it might be a case of like, you know, when you grow up so poor, you don't really get that many presents anyway. So I end up having to like compartmentalize the joy of Christmas until I end up getting a job and getting that first job when you're young, especially when you don't have any contacts or like me, you don't necessarily like to ask people for things. You just like to do things on your own. It was fucking difficult. That's something that doesn't get emphasized enough um, to youth in general. I think sometimes edu- education can be like, you know, people can be poo-pooing the whole university thing. Don't go to college, don't go to university. Nah, nah, nah. Great, don't get me wrong, but sometimes it can be a benefit for just getting a job. For being able just to get like a regular, regular nine-to-five jobs, it could, it could be quite beneficial to go to college or to go to university and do like, I don't know, a vocational B-Tech in college or like a degree somewhere that you're going to get like an actual good job from it. I think it might be beneficial because you kind of bypass all the difficulties that I have to go through in order to kind of get a first job when you're 16. It's just like, it's it's insane how hard it is, especially in an area where the majority of kids also are coming from low-income families. So they all want to get jobs too in order to kind of provide for themselves to buy the things that they want in their lifestyle and support their kind of lifestyle. So there's, the jobs are not necessarily, they're not necessarily, um, um, they're not, they're not the most complex jobs in the world, but they're very, very, very high in demand. And there's not many of them going around. And um, the employers know this too. So they, you know, they kind of dangle the car in front of your head and make you fucking jump, jump, jump high in order to get a job, which I wasn't prepared to do, which made the <laughs> the job shows even harder. Imagine me being stubborn, right? Not wanting to ask for help. Uh, not wanting to jump um, for the carrot when the employers ask you to do a million one things, to go on a trial shift, um, to I don't know to do this blah 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 or whatever they they ask you to do I didn't want to do it so they made the the the, the task doubly 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 hard and then eventually um eventually I think the first job I ever got in my life I think so was it might actually been fine up it might have been because of my uncle my uncle might have helped me get a job at Hollywood Bowl because I think he was a cleaner or the sorry he was the what do they call it? Uh, he was a janitor um, there, so the kind of all you know, all encompassing handyman. But if the cleaner wasn't there, he would clean up. If this wasn't about, he just took care of the whole kind of building, which is you know no mean feat considering how big a Hollywood Bowl is. So for the, I think that might be my first actual legit job. And then once you get that first job, it all kind of snowballs. I think that's it. Probably works the same way in the entertainment industry, right? Once you get once you get one chance to prove yourself, and you do show up and you prove yourself, um, everyone kind of knows you have someone to count on, and they kind of let you in. But before that, it kind of seems so daunting. Like, how the hell am I going to get in? When's anyone going to invite me to film? So you kept, you know, what I mean, that kind of mind fun happens, but. That's something that doesn't get um, stressed enough with kids. Like maybe it's a good idea just to go to university or to do a, a kind of vocational. Uh, sort of course in college just so you can bypass all that bullshit i had to do in terms of job hunting and it makes it a lot more easy because you jump on quite easily but yeah so that's what kind of kind of decentized me from christmas because you know you don't have money in the home and you're like i think my parents stopped really bothering to get us gift when we kind of turned of age kind of we were like maybe 14 well when i was 14 13 maybe she stopped really bothering with the christmas gifts um and kind of like the christmas gift was that the food that was getting cooked so that was always good we didn't have much money at home but my mum always made an effort to kind of like save a bit of money just for just for christmas do you know what i mean and usually because our family wasn't we're not necessarily the most even though we're african we're not necessarily the most uh family oriented fam- we don't really go to other people's houses and shit we do that like sp- sporadically here or there we kind of will keep it all in house so there's only five mouths to feed um, I say only, you know, because there's still a lot of food uh, to to feed people with in general. And my mum always liked to have a lot left over for like leftovers the following weeks and whatnot. But yeah, we find it. Um, it was fairly. Christmas doesn't celebrate that much actually. I think that might have been. I think we stopped even having trees in our house maybe when I was twelve or some shit, maybe eleven. 
We stopped even having trees and decoration. Cause I remember we used to go ham. I remember we used to do all the fake snow shit. Uh, used to do the tinsel, the lights, the fucking reindeer in the front door. Like all that, uh, the kind of, what's that crest, that little ring thing you put on your door thing. The rain, the kind of plastic rubber reindeer thing. Mum did it all. She was proper, proper involved. Um, which is funny because I don't think a lot of African parents really give that shit. Give two hoos about Christmas because, you know, most of them are um, religious to some extent. So, you know, the idea that you're celebrating Father Christmas maybe can kind of veer into the lane of ideology and all that sort of malarkey, right? Um, uh, or the worship of idols, for the, for the for lack of a better word. That's a Zach phrase. I heard my mum say quite a lot. We're not worshipping idols. But yeah, so uh, Christmas for me was always a no-go. And then when I did finally get money, I did finally have my own kind of disposable income to sort of spend on myself, I really didn't care for Christmas either. I think I kind of slotted it in the same sort of uh, draw as birthdays, you know, in the same sort of sense. You know, again, you grow up in a family without that much money. Birthdays aren't really something that you celebrate like everyone else does. And also, we, we're we not the most, um, what would I say? Uh, I wouldn't say our family is the most, tac- is the most like, um, tactilely lovey dovey family, you know. I think sometimes if you come from a very forget have having money, I think if you come from a family where your mom and dad's always telling you that they love you every few seconds, right? It's always a bit weird for me, a bit cringe, right? You're not saving it for the moments that actually matter. Like when it, just popping out Tesco's, love you, love you, love you. It's like what the fuck, man. That that word has lost this fucking, you know, what I mean, power. When you just keep saying love you when someone gets you a fucking pencil from the other side of the room. But anyway, that that um, doesn't need to be spoken about now. But I guess if you come from a family that you know it's quite lovey dovey, um, you know, um, little things are celebrated like victories. You know, you passing a spelling bee or getting hundred percent of your attendance. You know, everyone celebrates. I think maybe that's when cel- birthdays can be a big thing because I always kind of wondered that growing up especially when older you get like you know because i have friends in my social group that take their birthdays very very seriously some people that have like the birthday weekend maybe have the birthday week some people have the birthday month now it's how it's been happening a, a, a few times i've been seeing especially if your birthday falls at towards the end of the month it's like a thing to gear up towards the actual celebration of it which is always kind of cringe me out and i'm like it's weird that there's grown-ups adults of a big age right out there that are purposely celebrating their birthdays for an extended period of time and it's not the fact that they're celebrating it. I think that's fine. Do what you want to do. It's the fact that they require their friends to celebrate it as much as they are celebrating it, right? It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not even a requirement. It's an obligation. You have to attend my birthday. You have to do this for me. You have to go there. You have to do that, blah, blah, blah. And usually, the people that are doing these birthdays don't even do it the way I like to do it. When I did my, I think my last birthday that I celebrated when I used to go to church was I took a few of my friends from church out to go Nando's. And the way that my family did our birthdays or the way we used to do it back in the day when I used to celebrate birthdays. So, for instance, like, not much money in the house. So, you stop getting presents at a certain time. And then we, what my mum ended up doing was just give me 50 pounds or something and telling me, yeah, uh, take this money and go take your friends out for some, some, something to eat. So, it was my birthday and I took my friends out to go something to eat. So, like, I pay for the meal. That was, that was kind of our family tradition with the birthday, which was quite cool. I love the idea. I love that you know, the, 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 the more the years progress and the more I'm able to kind of do the things that I want to do and actualize kind of my plans and kind of get close to my goals and have a bit more disposable income. I love to do that more often, right? I mean, like a small group of friends and I'll take them out for a meal. Like I, I want you guys to come and celebrate my birthday. Um, the food's on me. You guys just pay for drinks or whatever it may be. Do you know what I mean? Like just something cool like that. So I remember my last one that I did when I was, when I was, um, used to hang around with some people that I used to go to church with, I took them all out for Nando. So I think I might've got like 150 quid or something. I don't know how much it was. So imagine that's a lot of money to go into Nando's because I don't know. Yeah. At that time as well, Nando's was a bit cheaper. Um, so yeah, I took the money, I took the money and just took my friend out to go Nando's and everyone kind of got a meal on me. Do you know what I mean? Which is fucking amazing. Right. And everyone just got, all you got to do is pay for your little refillable drink, but you get a meal, which is fucking banging. Um, but nowadays, people require you to go to like a fancy restaurant somewhere in the middle of Mayfair, of Covent Garden, right? Finchley, Bermondsey, wherever this restaurant is, and they want you to fucking pay for a restaurant that you didn't have any kind of say in where they were going. You, it, it came in the middle of the month where you're waiting for your next paycheck, you're, or you're in between paychecks, you I don't know, whatever's happening in life. And you're required to go now and spend another hundred quid to celebrate someone's birthday. I never really got that, um, all, all in all. It kind of makes more, you'd kind of, I'd kind of be a bit more happy if you just told me to come around your house and you'd cook dinner and then there was a minimum donation of like a hundred quid or something and I'd just give that to you for your birthday, right? I, that I wouldn't actually mind. It'd be a bit weird still, but I'd much rather do that than having to spend, I don't know, 50 quid to go to some restaurant somewhere that I don't really want to go to. But, you know, you do what you got to do. So I guess maybe 
um, that was one of the things that kind of led to the unliking of Christmas and birthdays and whatever it may be. But, you know, I guess the holidays are nice. People do them well. Um, I think for the most part in the area that I live in, I don't really see acknowledgement that it's Christmas so far. I think the moment I try, I step into Westfield area, I had to go to the um, bank the other day to deposit some money. And I noticed it was Christmas there because obviously the lights are all on, the entire bridge is lit up, the front of West of the shopping centre is like a fucking Christmas tree. It's insane, right? And I assume it's the same thing in central London. But for the most part, in most areas, especially around here, in these sort of areas in London, you don't see any acknowledgement that it's Christmas at all. Maybe because it's a low-income area and stuff. Like, Newham is one of the, like, um, what do you call it, most uh, impoverished boroughs, I think, in London overall. So that might explain some of it. So a lot of the parents probably here don't want to spend their money on decorating the outside at home. They'd rather just like save money and buy their kid a fucking computer, console, whatever it may be, or an iPad. But yeah, you don't really see an acknowledgement of Christmas. I don't really get the Christmas feel. The only thing I know is Christmas is the cold, but then it's not snowing. So that's the other part of it. That's a bit of a bummer. Like if it's going to be Christmas, at least fucking snow. Give me some Give me some snowflakes. Let me go out there and do a little snow angel and shit. You know what I mean? Play around, throw some snowballs and whatever it may be. But yeah, we here we are, December, heading into the new year. What are you going to do for the new year? What are you going to do for Christmas? Are you going to be a Christmas person? Are you going to enjoy yourself? Are you going to put a tree up? Are you going to do all those fancy, wancy things that people like to do? If you are, leave a comment below and let me know. <laughs> but yeah, um, let's head into some topics because I think that might be the most interesting part of the day as per usual. have a bunch of things that I've been uh, meaning to talk about throughout the week. I've got a lot of things I need to get through that I haven't end up getting through that I need to probably do now before the end of the year because I want to do a little wrap, round up show before the year ends and whatever. But let's just get into it, right? As that fucking um, wild Philip DeFranco says. I used to, I tried, tried to watch that channel a few times and I know he's doing amazing things. People like him and he's probably got a fan base and whatever, but that really fast YouTube talking thing, and I probably, I talk quite fast too, so I can't really complain, but he talks faster than me. Like if I'm on 1.5, he's on 2.5 for sure. Um, it's just too much, man. Like, it's just like constantly rabbiting on. And if you noticed, um, Philip, De, Philip DeFranco went on to, went on a Joe Rogan podcast, ever, I think a few months ago. And I, there was a couple of times where Joe Rogan told him, relax, shit, take it easy. A couple of those YouTube people, whenever they go on a podcast, they can't necessarily rein it in because they're so used to trying to fit in loads of information in a short period of time. Like, you know, um, but yeah, I just wasn't a fan of that constantly fast talking at me and just giving me, just telling me stuff that I don't really need to know. Do you know what I mean? Like celebrity gossip stuff and all this other nonsense, like just like shoot me in the fucking head. But anyway, talking about celebrities, right? Because, you know, I'm complaining about Philip DeFranco doing something. And I'm doing exactly the same thing. Um, so very, very sad news happened um, over the last couple of 24 or the last 24 hours that I'm sure some of you guys have missed and you haven't been aware of. But, you know, I'm Agostino here, your friendly podcast host is going to make you aware and let you know exactly what's going on in these mean streets of London. But supposedly um, it's come to my attention that the great, the great, 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 great um symbol of the American dream, right? The quintus the undisputed or you know royal family of America have finally called it quits on their app. And you know what I'm talking about? The Kardashians and the Jenners. Or Kardashian dash Jenners I've seen people refer them to, which I'm not sure if that's a thing. But um supposedly uh they have put an end to their apps, which I'm surprised that to be honest because i'm sh it, it was a bit it, the apps in general i didn't necessarily get when they launched because you know in an era of social media and considering that their family the Kardashians, jenners whatever are probably the best proponents of how to engage with a with a fan base through social media right they've done it the best the best secured on the highest level probably people have taken notes you know, from the fact that Kim Kardashian never posts the same picture on Twitter and on Instagram, you know, like they're always different sort of pictures, different sort of content, <laughs> that kind of idea, the idea of like uploading a picture and then deleting it if it hasn't got this right sort of light, like even if it's got the likes and shit, like really cross attention to detail with stuff that they've kind of pioneered that a lot of people are kind of copying now. So I kind of never really saw the point of them making an app. Like maybe again, it's just another revenue, um, another stream of revenue because, you know, then in your little walled garden, you can maybe have like exclusive promotion deals for people that are on the app and stuff. And you can maybe have some kind of walled content. But for the most part, all the content that was on the app that they didn't want, that they only want access to their fans, everyone else got to see anyway. Whether it was through like compilation videos on YouTube, whether it was like through uh, fan accounts on IG or whatever, maybe somebody always reposted that 
information somewhere else on another platform. So it didn't really make that much sense. And if they want to be in control of what they're saying and how it gets out of there, then they might as well just do it in public where everyone else can see. And in general, just the kind of upkeep to kind of keep that right app running. There's probably a team behind it that has to, you know, end up um, fixing any sort of bugs and whatever it may be. It's just an unnecessarily, it's unnecessary expense on top of what they already have. And the fact that they each have one too, probably made it a little bit un- uh, didn't really make much sense maybe going forward they might end up doing like a Kardashian Jenner overall app that kind of encompasses their whole family that probably might make more sense and if you're going to do an app you're probably better off just doing a game like what they did before right they did that sort of shopping game uh, sort of like Sims kind of uh, malarkey thing that probably made more sense than doing an app where you're just sharing social media content that is already out there in, there in general but yeah so I saw it highlight today um, an article actually on um, E! News read as follows the kardashian jenner family is looking to start afresh in the new year and that means bidding farewell to their official apps as you can see there they are there i hate these websites where like the video kind of comes in line when you scroll down it's just annoying isn't it just constantly the yeah, x go away anyway so uh kardashian yeah they uh, have announced on wednesday that the, each of their websites will go dark in 2019 they've written the following we had an incredible experience connecting with all our um, with all of you through our apps these past few years but have made difficult decisions to no longer continue updating in 2019 we truly hope you enjoy this journey as much as we have and we look forward to what's ahead a statement reads around the time around this time last year Kendall Jenner echoed the same similar film when she sh- okay she shut her down last uh, last year which made more sense because she's probably the most um, low key of the sisters isn't she um, Kendall and it continues uh, launch 2015 access to the stars app cost subscribers £2.99 a month which is fucking a lot of money there again that's a that's um a good example of what leaving money on the table means in order for kind of maybe quality of life and maybe in terms of like easing headaches in terms of maybe uh continuing your efforts in different avenues whatever it may be that's a lot of money they're leaving on the table two dollars 99 per each subscriber is fucking insane considering how many downloads they must have got on the app in general there's people obviously on there that just downloaded the app and just haven't used it since or people that are just cheapskates just use the kind of the free just kind of on the other day for the free content but that is nuts because i remember the same time that they did it i think the same company that might have did theirs might have done a uh, talented creators app for golf for golf uh, media i think it was called uh, so you got to have exclusive content from um golf wang is it golf radio or something to do that sort of lines um, i forgot what the radio station is called in la where they have a few of those guys from the golf wang, from um odd future kind of crew have their own radio shows but i remember they had their own sort of app too and you kind of that's where they kind of store i think originally i'm not too sure don't hold me to that but yeah, that's a lot of money on the table they're leaving, man. Two dollar ninety nine is fucking insane. So credit to them. Um, it continues. The reality TV personalities continue switching uh, things up in their empire. As just eight months ago, Kim Kardashian announced the closure of her Dash clothing boutiques. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, of course, that's not to say that Kardashian's fame is slowing down. Just yesterday, twenty one year old yeah, cool. We talked about that, but yeah. So that's uh, that's news. I kind of never knew that was happening. So they closed down the apps. Makes more sense actually. Concentrate on whatever you got on social media now at the moment. Um, the, you never know what's gonna happen next year. Again, guessing wise, if I'm gonna have to speculate, they may they might do a, a Kardashian Jenner app overall that kind of encompasses the entire family, and maybe there's different channels that you can kind of access on it. Because I'm thinking, I have a deep, I have a feeling. Again, it's just from what I'm doing. I'm just echoing the kind of temp, the temp, the my own personal temperament. Considering that I'm on every single social platform, social media. Well, I've tried every single social media platform that exists out there. I always try things and dabble and see if I can use it or not. Right. So for the most part, I've kind of stopped really. I've stopped really um, uh, using or browsing on Instagram. I don't really. The only thing I use quite heavily now is probably Twitter and Facebook because of my uh, DJ events and whatnot. There may be so that's probably the main subject, and uh, main platform I use that for. But for the most part, I'm concentrating more of my efforts on like you know, blogs, um, articles, and all that sort of malarkey. Actual going on the internet, right? For the most part, I don't necessarily get my information from um, social media platforms like uh, the brunette. Does, for instance, like she's just always on Instagram. Every news piece that she gets from. Every piece of news that she knows about is from an Instagram post. It's whether it's from the shade room, whether it's from whatever website it may be, or it comes from Instagram. So I don't necessarily do that. I do the opposite. So there's a lot of people that are doing that also. And I think in general, I think in media, or I think in you know the whole land, the media landscape, there's a few companies out there, a few personalities who are starting to kind of pull away from the social media platforms and they're wanting their fans to kind of go to their own dedicated websites, wherever they may be, right? So for instance, for me in general, like I think for the new year, I'm going to start ramping up in terms of like 
writing on my blog all the time. I don't do it as often as I want to do it now. I want to kind of do it every day in the same vein as like a Seth Godin. So I want to keep continually publishing um, articles and pieces I want to think, just things I'm thinking about on my blog, right? So imagine that blog becomes like a quote unquote online magazine, but that's my own platform that I kind of own. It's not, it's not on internet. It's not on fucking uh, in Twitter. It's not on Instagram, not on Facebook. It lives on um my blog site so i'm not kind of again i can distribute on the platform but for the most part it lives on there so i think if you're general kardashian you kind of maybe want your fans to kind of only exist on the platforms that you build so it might be good to kind of like encompass it all underneath one umbrella and take them away from the social media platforms and kind of get them more to go to one spot um the fact that she's closing the, the store is interesting too because it seems like there's a few people that are making a move towards retail brick and mortar stores there's that one girl i forgot her name i think she's scandinavian an influencer sort of fashion girl um who's now opened a new boutique somewhere i think in mayfair um um i forgot the name i think it's annie or hanny or any or something like that anyway some girl uh she does kind of like you know the standard sort of like um instagrammy type fashion needs to kind of close you know the kitten heel shoes the, the blue jeans the statement bag the big shirling coat you know the kind of general kind of flow and they're moving into brick and mortar stores even though she's fucking killing it on the e-commerce end so she kind of kind of came up from being like an influencer on social media uh then started wearing brands then, then started wearing a uh, you know, big big brand clothing items and kind of doing that kind of influencer role and then kind of slowly segue their way into like, oh, I want a particular sort of item. I can't find it. and make it for myself. Selling a few bits and pieces on like a Shopify account or Shopify store and then slowly segueing into like being a big brand and having a store. In the same vein as like a nasty girl. So I think the kind of change I think is going to happen is a lot, a lot of these brands are going to try and get their own platforms and kind of go back to traditional forms of media, traditional modes of communication. So you're going to see uh, ramping up of newsletters again on email email newsletters are going to be big again you're seeing that happening a lot now with uh platforms such as like stub is it stub hub or stub or stub or stock bucket i've got the name there's the, but there's like a platform now at the moment where you can kind of sign up and you can kind of create your own newsletters and people can pay you to make more newsletters it's sort of like a patreon newsletter kind of format people are going to go back to doing blogs again that's going to be quite big in terms of opinion pieces uh things that you want to write it's quite a, it's already a big thing now in, on medium and stuff but i think the, the return back to like blog spots and wordpress is going to come back again i think we're going to see a return back to people having their own websites where everything just lives on there media whatever it may be um and that will also spell probably the end of people clamoring for netflix uh specials in comedian in the comedian circles because now in the, uh, in the comedy circuit for the most part everyone kind of is clamoring to have like their stand-up special on netflix right so that's why everyone kind of wants their thing to be on but there's so many on there that people don't really get around to watching them which is why netflix are kind of you know make must making a messing around with the template of doing like 30 minute specials uh there's been a few of them that's come on at the moment there's been the deplorables i think that's out now that's got jerry diaz on it one of my favorite comedians check that out on netflix but everyone's they're kind of changing the model and trying to instead of doing hour specials they're not doing 30 minute specials in general it's a kind of you know a response to people's attention span but also more so a way to kind of get people to kind of watch them first of in, in the first place it's only half an hour it's not an hour um so i think we're going to see a move away from that and maybe more back towards the traditional model or back to what um louis ck did what kind of made him one of the kind of forerunners in the whole comedy circuit away from just him being a super talented comedian is that he was kind of the first kind of guy to just like have his specials up on his website and people just pay for it on there um sort of like down i think i'm not sure if he downloaded a zip file or what it may be but he just had to buy the thing on his website only and i know i heard the other day uh, joe rogan mentioning with bill bird that he was contemplating having it just put it up on youtube um, I'm sure you could put up on YouTube as a YouTube bread thing or subscription. You could pay because they'd have films on there too. You could probably put it up on there for like a certain window it's paid for. And then after the certain window's over, you can then start maybe dropping it in segments and having little special little bits of the special app on segments. And then after that, releasing it free to the public. So you can kind of stagger the release. But I think we're going to see a move away from the whole thing because I think with people being deplatformed, de people's YouTube's account being closed down because they said the wrong thing, people being thrown off Twitter because they said the wrong thing. I think now people are go going to see especially the ones that are trying to get involved in the entertainment industry or just want to be an opinion you know an opinion sharer or be a critique of the industry whatever it may be i think now people have seen that you have to have your own platform 
the idea that you can go on other platforms and say what you want and have no consequences is kind of far and gone. I think the idea of like maybe just having a WordPress and a hosting website, you know, no, they're not responsible for the things that you say. Of course, it has to, you know, there's some limits what you can say, but I think that was probably the model that's going to come in. And then, you know, the sponsors, advertisers that want to align with you can then come along with that. Or if you're going to sell merch, you can kind of make an income on in that regard. Or if you want to maybe consult with people, I think you're going to see a move away from it. So watch this space. I think in general, I think the, not to be crude, but I think the Kardashians are kind of similar to like the porn industry where, you know, some people don't realize how technologically advanced the porn industry is, right? When it comes to streaming, when it comes to uh, VR, all that malarkey, just in terms of just video hosting, right? How ahead of the curve they were and kind of everyone else kind of followed suit, like quietly kind of copied the things that they were doing. I feel the like Kardashian Jenners are sort of like that, in that sort of like lane. So if you're seeing them kind of pull away from having their own dedicated app and kind of, you know, simplifying the way they do social media, that sort of malarkey, Pay, pay very very close attention to it because everyone else is going to be copying it i think from um in the future i believe anyway so let's see what happens anyway i'm not nostradamus what the fuck do i know anyway next on the list here um gatwick drones causing delays oh this has been a pretty uh contemptuous situation isn't it so the other i think the other day i think or two days ago there were reports that there were like severe delays in Gatwick and that always kind of happens, right? I think um, for the people that, for the news reporters and the news stations in general, uh, Christmas is Christmas period and summer period is sort of like, you know, when weather people, um, especially the American weather, the American weather reporters, um, when they hear of a flood or a hurricane coming, they all go all, they go all out, right? They do that whole, you've seen that, um, that sort of like, I think it's VR. There's like an or augmented reality sort of like backdrop that they did where they kind of had the thing where it looked, sort of looked like it was a real flood happening. They can kind of show you an infographic and all that malarkey. So I think the news reports kind of get a bit of a boner when it comes to Christmas because, you know, there's always going to be delays on the trains. There's going to be delays on the tube. There's going to be delays sorry, on the rail, on the tube, delays on coaches, delays on planes, delays everywhere. And that makes for a real good like fodder. Uh, for video cameras to pick up right of like cues of like little kids crying people sleeping on the floor so they're quite you know a they, they, they like to maybe hype up some of the delays that happen so when i saw the story in the first in the, uh, on the first instance i kind of thought you know what not that big of a deal right it's like yeah delays happen what can you do but then i looked into it a bit further i was like shit man that's fucked up man i'd be so pissed so actually the story goes and i saw on the bbc that supposedly a drone had um, come into the flight path of a few planes or was in the kind of vicinity where, you know, planes are going to be passing, which in which in turn caused major, major delays, isn't it? Because obviously, you know, they can't let these planes pass if these fucking um, drones are flying all over the place. And it made me think that, you know, imagine how you'd feel if a drone uh, decided to kind of fly ahead of... Oh, let me actually get the, the footage up here. So this is a video from the BBC, right? Kind of talking about... But imagine how you'd feel if a plane like kind of you know careered um, into the wing of if a drone careered into the wing of your plane as you're going on the holiday just imagine just the absolute disruption that gets caused from a drone flying it's something that we don't necessarily think about too often but it also maybe spells the end of maybe drones being flown in general um let me put it up on here yep got it here and i'll show you now like this here you go a nightmare situation for pilots and passengers. A drone striking a plane at high altitude and top speed. This experiment from the University of Dayton shows a worst case and unlikely scenario, but there have been several near misses, with drones coming within a few feet of commercial aircraft, so the industry doesn't take any chances. Depending on the speed of the drone, or the relative speed of the drone and the aircraft and the weight of the drone, you can get some significant damage. With a drone collision you against something like an A380 or an A320 or whatever it happens to be, you risk killing maybe two, three hundred people or more. It's not the first time an airport has been closed due to illegal drone activity. In July 2017, some flights from Gatwick Airport were delayed or diverted after a drone was spotted flying on the airport's approach path. But previous incidents have been dealt with in a matter of minutes, not hours. Now the police say the disruption is deliberate. The price of drones has fallen dramatically. They're now available in catalogues and toy shops, and in the UK you currently don't need to register your purchase. 
Although it's illegal to fly within a kilometer or about a thousand yards of an airport, those hoping to cause disruption can easily flout those rules. I think the real point is that, you know, it, it is an asymmetric threat and we, we need to deal with it effectively. And the people that are responsible for the security of airports and things need to uh, invest to ensure that we've got good strength and depth in, in terms of the security for people uh, operating out from airports. Drone manufacturers can build in geofencing, which stops the drone flying near an airport, although that can be easy to overcome. They could use a signal jammer that stops the remote control communicating with the drone, but that won't work if it's flying along a pre-programmed path. Now companies are developing counter-drone technology to deal with the threats, like this drone-catching net deployed from another aircraft. And aviation giant Boeing has showed off this drone-busting laser that heats up an aircraft's battery and makes it catch fire. The rules in the UK are expected to tighten in 2019 with the introduction of a drone register. But the problems at Gatwick today show that this is not something legislation alone. Imagine that. Imagine, imagine that. Imagine that, right? So I think the disruption has been caused. I think it's over a day now so far, right? People have been getting delayed for their trips to go home and stuff. And it's just an absolute nightmare. Absolute, absolute nightmare. Something that I'd be so, 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 so annoyed about if I heard it. So how much has happened so far? How much... How can so much chaos cause? So what's happened here? Um, Gatwick Airport reopened its runway on Friday. So it's just opened this morning. So I think a whole day, whole day it's been out, right? Hundreds of flights were grounded due to drones being spotted over the airfield on Wednesday and Thursday. Jesus Christ. Amazing, isn't it? Absolutely insane. So uh, we're definitely going to see an, an end to drones very, very soon. Do you, we love to like spoil the fun in the UK anyway, but this is a serious enough topic, enough, this is a serious enough issue that I don't really begrudge the authorities to kind of like putting their foot down and saying, you know what, enough's enough because this is probably enough is enough. Um, imagine going away and then having your whole flight delayed for a day or two because you, because you, you know, some idiot decided to fly their drone somewhere over near an airport. Annoying. But I guess people flying their, this is obviously a deliberate thing. They're wanting to kind of, you know, cause disruption and whatever it may be. Um, but it does bode sadly, isn't it? Like could, um, could, it, could, could potentially terrorists start using drones? Um, to inflict kind of chaos on the nation, maybe that that could be a thing, isn't it? As well, these little fucking tiny things, purposely fly them into planes in order to kind of bring it down and shit. That would be nuts. Um, but yeah, crazy. Airports already enough a fucking a, a ball lake to deal with anyway, as it is, especially when it's like a, during a peak season or a peak time uh, during the year. During the year, which is you know so far so like today is probably one of them. Uh, occasions probably people are just gonna start leave the latest people can can leave is probably today and tomorrow right like Friday and Saturday um before they get to their destination of trace before Christmas and shit but yeah crazy crazy times drones flying into airplanes who would have fucking thought it right first of all we first the only thing we saw with drones was likes of Casey Neistat and whatever they may be using them to kind of fly on, fly in line with them was as they were skating on their um electronic skateboard and now we're at a point in life where like these I don't know drone anarchists are purposely flying them into airplane air uh, flight paths or to kind of cause disruption. Crazy, crazy times, isn't it? Anyway, next topic: Stratford shopping mall homeless. Yeah, man. So um, weird, isn't it? This is a weird topic because I want to be sensitive and also be um respectful for those who are in this current situation. But you know, life kind of throws you. Life does throw some um. Life does throw some obstacles in your way, right? Whether it be, um, you know, not getting the thing you wanted, not getting the promotion you wanted, um, you know, holiday not working out, losing money, you know, whatever it may be, I, whatever, right? Life life is difficult for all of us. We've all got our little challenges that we face. And there are occasions where you can sometimes get a bit wrapped up in your own thing and think, oh, woe is me, woe is me. I need a violin even though I don't play one, right? You you get super fucking sad, right? You know, you know that kind of sad where you start adult crying. That's sort of crying like, <laughs> you know, that's sort of crying, right? Where bogey's running down your face and you just fucking, you know, you are in absolute pieces. You know the kind of crying where if someone touches you, they make you cry even more. So you're crying, and if someone touches you, like it's alright, you know. 
You know, that, that's that real pain. You know, when someone kind of comforts you, it reminds you of what love is. And then you start crying even more. Fucking nuts, right? Life can be that hard. But there's also moments that make life quite sobering and also make you put things into perspective, which is, you know, is an overused term. People kind of use it to kind of give themselves a kind of, you know, virtual signal to give themselves a pat on the back. I understand. But on one of those occasions, I was kind of contemplating some life decisions and just generally thinking about what I wanted to do next. And I was thinking, um, I think it was one of the times I was coming back from DJing or something along the lines of that. And I was walking across the road from Westfield Shopping Centre, um, past the kind of the Burger King, into into shopping mall. And that entire, like, I think maybe the beginning of the year or maybe the end of, in the middle of last year, the entirety of that shopping, shopping mall had been kind of overrun with young kids, right? Um, youth of the area who I'd never seen in my life, right? I'd never seen any kids in Stratford, Forest Gate, Cannon Town, all that, or Plaster, all the surrounding areas, right, look the way I look, right? I've always kind of been one of the only people that's kind of looked the way I do, whether it's the clothes I wear, the things I'm listening to, whatever it may be, right? Just the kind of overall aesthetic. Not to say that I'm fucking a leader of anything. I just even never saw anyone look like me when I was younger, in general. So it was a bit of a mind fuck to like suddenly walk into a shopping mall and see fucking kids on skateboards, see kids just hanging around, smoking weed, listening to music on their loudspeakers, seeing a group of other kids like break dancing and shit, seeing another group of kids uh, rollerblading. Like, I was like, what the fuck is going on? This is amazing. And then the Shafford's like, Shafford's completely transformed overnight. Like, it's, you know, one, one minute it's, it's like a no go zone. Next minute, you got all these amazing kids just like, you know, coming out um after all the shops have closed and enjoying themselves you know what i mean having a blast hanging out just doing what i used to do when i was younger um not in a shopping mall but like you know in other places but doing the same sort of thing but doing it in a much funner way imagine they're doing everything in underneath one underneath like a heat a quote-unquote heated shopping mall i thought that was cool so i thought wow wow shopping is moving up is moving on up it's not just related to westwood then um as the years progressed for the most part i had not i'd not really gone through strapper shopping mall after the shops are closed, I usually always kind of, even when I'm DJ, or even when I'm walking back home from Hackney Wick, I always kind of walk around the, the sort of like Stratford Village Way, which is where all the new built flats are that they built uh, post, I mean, pre the, the London Olympics, right? So I kind of walk around that area and I kind of avoid the whole Stratford shopping mall. But this is the one occasion where I didn't. I walked through the shopping mall and just to kind of, you know, go. I think the, the, the reason why was I was going to go to McDonald's or something along those lines, right? So I'm walking through the shopping mall and then all you're seeing now, is st- instead of hearing the, the clang of uh, polyurethane wheels from skateboards and uh, roller skates and hearing music and whatever it may be. Now, the only thing you hear is people like arguing or like, you know, just general um, uh, commotion of human beings. And all you all your eyes see are like sheets of cardboard everywhere, sleeping bags everywhere. It's like a little mini village. Like, you know, um, I forgot that place in LA, but there's a place, in, it might be Skid Row somewhere else, but there's a place in LA, like there's an entire street just full of homeless people. It's like they've, they, it's like they've made their own little village, they've made their own little village sort of thing, right? Where just like, you know, it's just like the, all the downtrodden people, you know, people that have kind of, kind of a hard time just all kind of uh, congregate in this whole one street. And Shuffle Shopping Mall has now become that one place after, let's say, 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. with the shops closed. And it's pretty, pretty uh, sobering. Um, to kind of walk through it, especially when you're not aware of it. I wasn't aware of it. I was coming from playing. I was coming from my little, um, you know, enclave where I was getting to pay, pay to play music in a bar where I got free drinks, where I was getting pats on the back, where I was, you know, feeling good about myself. And then you're finally walking and then you're just ending on the way home. You're maybe contemplating, oh, I should do this, should have done that. I'm a loser. I should do more. I should do this, uh, there. And you finally walk through shopping, 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 shopping mall and you're like confronted by all these homeless people. And the thing that makes it even more distressing is that they're not the conventional homeless that you're aware of, that, you know, the people that maybe are panhandling on the street or if it may be or the people that obviously look like they may be suffering from some sort of addiction problems. These people look like me and you. They look like everyday people on the street who just are, um, by all intents and purposes, they are the conventional homeless people. They've been displaced. They've kind of come into a situation where maybe the council hasn't been able to find a temporary accommodation or maybe they've been uh, chucked out of their house, or maybe they've had an argument with somebody, and they've kind of you know, in between jobs, so they don't, they don't have money money for the deposit, or maybe they haven't got the deposit back, and just you know stuff happens where you just like you know you just have end up in a situation where all of a sudden you don't have a house anymore, and you have to like you know live outside, and they generally just have all their possessions in their backpack, and I just saw loads of guys, especially young dudes um, about my age or maybe a year younger, just like sleeping rough, 
like generally sleeping rough and that's the only time they're gonna get a chance to sleep so they just sleep and probably just wake up later and just stay up the whole day again walking around i don't know hanging out in the library and again it makes a lot of sense talking about the library because i when i used to go to the library a lot because now i don't i usually kind of stay home and read my books but when i used to go to the library to read cause sometimes i think in the beginning when i wasn't i didn't even have the habit of reading i'd kind of go to a library and then set a timer and then sit down and kind of read for an hour and come back sort of like a gym right and i kind of built up my habit of reading but now i kind of do that at home but when I used to go to the library a lot. I used to always, I used to always wonder, like, how come there's so many people in here just hanging around, just, just sitting around, just not reading and not doing nothing, just like you know, because you know it's a warm place, there's nice chairs for the most part. People just sitting around, maybe having something to eat, but just sitting around the whole library, it's just full of people. It's not like a conventional, but I think in most you know metropolitan cities, if you go to a library, it's probably empty, right? Not a lot of people are actually in there. I've heard of stories of some libraries. What was that library? I think it was in the U somewhere in the UK where there's a library that not not one book had been taken out the whole calendar year, which was fucking nuts, right? So um I remember always thinking there's a lot of people in the library and they're not necessarily doing library things, right? Because I'd go in there with a notepad or re- I don't know, you know, you expect me to see people in there just like doing what I'm doing, reading, taking notes, or some kids revising for a test. I don't know, whatever it may be. And I never saw, saw that, but this makes more sense. This adds more credence as to why the library is always so full. Because those same people that are displaced or are, quite, are like, you know, quit, basically homeless need another place to kind of, you know, need some shelter, especially in the cold months of December. And they just all congregate to the library and just sitting down and kind of like, you know, staring into space or whatever it may be. And it's like, fuck, man. It's like super sobering. You really start to realize like, wow, man. So people are like falling on some fucking hard times. And again, it's just like, you know, it just, it just happens. It's one of those kind of things in life. It's not even like a, it's not necessarily even a thing of like, oh, it's the person's fault. It's just life happened and, they f- and they're now in a position where, you know, they're homeless. So, you know, you got to make the bo- best out of it. So they get some cardboard, they wrap up warm and they just sleep. And that whole entire Stratford shopping mall is just full of those people. There's not, you don't even hear of kids in there anymore. They're not even in there. I'm guessing maybe now because it's colder, they don't, they don't hang around there. But I wonder where those kids have gone because, you know, they're like, it, again that must be distressed that must be distressing too to be in there skateboarding and seeing all these people just hanging around just sleeping on the floor and stuff and it probably is a bit you know you don't really want to uh disturb their sleep or fuck around with them too much so you kind of let it go but you see a lot of people walking past there um in Stratford shopping mall um you know kind of seeing it for the first time and kind of like not looking again like it's sort of quite distressing and i remember i think jordan peterson saying it once before that the reason why we don't look at panhandlers, we don't look at people begging on the street, we don't always like to look at them in the face because it's like um, that represents hell. We don't like to, we don't want to have a rem- we don't want to that because basically we see ourselves in them. Yeah, you, know? you you don't necessarily think you're again if you're like a rational person, if you're like a a nice person, you don't necessarily see a a, a homeless person, or someone begging on the street, and think oh I'm above that. You can sympathize with the fact that you know this person is in a, is in need, right? They're desperate. They need something. So you don't necessarily want to remind yourself of what that looks like. So you kind of like shirk away from it. And I remember Jordan Peterson saying like, that's what it is. Like homeless or people that are panning in the street kind of represent. It's like, it's like a living hell. It's like a living embodiment of what hell looks like, right? That internal kind of like cycle. That's what like, I think there's a scripture in the Bible or something like that, right? That it's like a constant fire or something in hell, whatever it may be, right? Um, you're just constantly burning without actually burning. So it's like that pain, that searing pain, just continuing on and on and on that anguish. And maybe that kind of idea that, you know, being homeless and being in that spiral of drugs and dr- drink, uh, alcohol and drugs and stuff and displacement and violence, whatever it may be. It's like a constant cycle. It never ends. You're always kind of like, you know, you're, you're probably, your life isn't as valuable enough in order for someone to end it, but it is also not valuable enough for someone to give a shit. So you're constantly in that kind of super cycle so again man it's super sobering it made me really um respect and give a lot of kudos to the people that we do have in an area which is quite cool we have quite a lot of uh police wardens i don't know what they're called the like community support police or whatever they, they are who kind of go around and make sure everyone's safe and whatever we always have a couple of people that come during the week we have one sort of like a soup kitchen van that comes around the corner to a church that's near me we have another sort of group of people that kind of come out and set up a table outside the burger king and kind of give away free soup, uh, tea, and all that sort of malarkey. So really thankful for those guys. They probably only come three times a week or whatever, maybe, or if, if that. I'm assuming they're going to probably ramp it up towards Christmas because there's always a time when, you know, the temperature drops and everyone kind of thinks about people that are homeless because, you know, they don't really have much family or places to go to. But, yeah, um, very, very sobering. And um, it reminded me, actually, of this really cool exhibition kind of slash book that I saw featured on Dolan. I think, where did I see it here? Let me check it out. 
see if I can get it up on here. There was a cool little exhibition book thing that kind of made me think as well. Just, you know, kind of re- made me re- made me rethink what it means to be homeless, right? Because you get this idea of the person you see on Liverpool Street Station, you know, super strung out or whatever it may be. But walking through Stratford, it's like, no, homeless people look exactly like you. Do you know what I mean? Like, they're just falling on a hard time sort of thing. And this project that I saw featured by this artist called uh, Nigel, N- Nigel Hafran? No, no, Nigel Shafran. Uh, and it's called The People of the Street. I think it's a book that's available now at Dolan Books, so check that out. I'm going to get up on the screen now, but it's effectively a, a photo, a photography project that the aim of it was to showcase people that were homeless without showing them being homeless. The quintessential quote-unquote homeless fashion. So you don't necessarily see anyone sleeping rough. It's just general kind of dudes um, that are obviously uh, falling on hard times. And this is a photography project that I kind of thought was quite cool. Um, can I move pictures here? But I recommend check it out. I don't think I can move. Can stop moving the pictures here anyway. But yeah, check it out. I'll put a link below on the on the thing so you, so you can see it. Um, but it's a pretty cool overall project that Nigel Safran did. I recommend you check it out. Where is it? Why is it not working? Ugh. Anyway, um, recommend you check it out. I'll, I'll put a link on the on the show notes so you can check it out yourself. But yeah. Um, yeah, I guess be thankful, man, position that you're in. Be thankful for whatever you have, wherever little it may be. Um, there's always somebody out there that has it harder than you, which is always kind of cliche to say. But it has to put things in perspective. and also lets you know that, you know, don't always, don't think you're bigger than what you are as well. Don't kind of buy into your hype too much or don't think you're above anyone. Most people don't anyway. I think it's kind of, that's only reserved for the sociopaths in the world. But for the most part, everyone's sort of like, you know, um, well-adjusted human being, but for anyone that kind of starts believing their own hype or starts to think that shit don't stink, like honestly, like your life could change like that in an instant. It could go from being super amazing to somehow you contemplating your overall life decisions and wondering how you got yourself in a place where you're suddenly sleeping in the middle of a shopping center. Um, again, super sobering, but again, thanks. Uh, big up to everyone that's involved in taking care of these people during the winter months as well, because that's something that you always kind of think about whenever you pass somebody that's displaced or homeless for the most part. Anyway, let's move on and kind of cheer things up a little bit into the next topic. Boring Tunnel, Hawthorne Tunnel. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, my favorite guy in the world, Elon Musk, someone who's kind of, you know, misunderstood, you know, sometimes on purpose and sometimes I think he kind of, he, sometimes on purpose by a journalist, and sometimes I think he. Uh, he kind of, I think Elon kind of likes the idea that he's misunderstood and he kind of um, divides opinion. I think he's not generally well loved amongst everyone. I think even if, when Steve Jobs was around, there were some people that didn't necessarily buy into the hype of Steve Jobs. Famously, that Bill Burr um, comedy um, bit that he does about he doesn't think he thinks Steve Jobs is a bit overrated, which is quite funny. And this is when Drip Bill Steve Jobs was, was about and alive, and people were like kind of lauding him as the next big thing, or as like a god or whatever it may be. Um, so that was quite funny but in general you know most kind of specific you know sometimes for his own kind of liking and stuff whatever but you can't deny his output right you can't deny the things that he's done from zip2 to paypal to spacex to tesla to now the boring company he's just like consistently continually try to you know um obviously in some way shape or form enhance his kind of station in life and be the you know the quintessential you know the living embodiment of iron man whatever that guy is i've got his name is but at the same time, he's always trying to. He's. I think he's. He's a necessary good in the world, right? He's net. It's net good for all the kind of bad he's doing. He's doing probably more good than he's doing bad. I think overall, that's how you can kind of judge most human beings. And one of the projects that really intrigued me a lot. Number one is the SpaceX uh, BFR project, right? The big fucking rocket, um, Earth to Earth um, transportation system. Um, that was something that kind of really, really captured my imagination. Um, I could quickly just get it up on here, actually show you the video about it. But that was something that kind of I thought, wow, this guy's fucking incredible. Um, the Tesla stuff I only kind of bought into late. I wasn't necessarily that sold on electric, ele- electric cars, but once the kind of iterations of Tesla mo- of Teslas uh, started to kind of get better and better and better, and the design started to get nicer and stuff, whatever it may be, I started to kind of really pay attention. And the moment they decided to move into a twin kind of engine car, that's when I kind of thought, okay, they're really onto something, right? But the, what really kind of got me was the SpaceX uh, BFR um, Earth to Earth uh, video, which in general, the whole kind of premise behind it was that they were going to create um, the uh, the big fucking rocket, which is, I think has been changed now to Starship. 
um, the design's been changed somewhat, and it's going to be the first kind of like sea, uh, you know, spacefaring uh, spacecraft that's going to be able to take people from Earth to Mars. But I think the idea behind it was that it's um, they're going to also, you know, to kind of make it sustainable. They're going to also implement a method that will allow people to do um, long distance trips um, within, you know, on planet Earth and within the fraction of the time it takes now on conventional airplanes. I know Elon Musk mentioned on the Joe Rogan podcast interview that he was going to he was kind of thinking about airplanes um in general but which might be a good uh, idea instead of like a, a sort of like a, a scaled down version of the bfr that can take people to like you know because essentially you're trying to take people on a missile to go uh, to another city but the whole general idea behind it is because the rockets are reusable and you can kind of re-land on the on the on the, on the land on the kind of wherever that thing is called that you take off from you could kind of effectively do a trip from like London to New York within half an hour. And this sort of video that I saw from, from uh, SpaceX really captured my imagination. Uh, stop it here. Get it up on there. But I thought this was the video that kind of really got me. It got, got me fucking going. I was like, you know what? This guy is an absolute genius. I'll put it up on here. You guys can see. So a Starship um, Earth to Earth. Uh, by SpaceX. So it says New York City at six foot, is it six something a.m. in the morning? See a group of people walking on a plank towards a a boat. And the boat then takes them out to the rocket. And then um, passengers go up on an, S on an elevator up to the top, take a seat, the rocket lifts off. I think it essentially goes just outside the orbit. And then I'm assuming the, yeah, and then it goes to its destination. So that what, it left New York at six in the morning and it got to where's the destination here? It's kind of taking, it's just amazing. It really captured my measure this whole video. I thought it was so cool. And it lands in Shanghai at 7.39 p.m. So it takes 39 minutes, 40 minutes to get from New York to Shanghai, which is insane, right? So Hong Kong to Singapore, 22 minutes. Los Angeles, Toronto, 24. Like, that's what really captured my imagination with the whole Elon Musk thing. But then what also got me hype was the Boring Company. And the whole Boring Company idea came from Elon Musk's kind of frustration with the kind of traffic jams in LA, which are well known from a lot of people that have been to LA. People that listen to people that live in LA, they're always talking about how crazy the traffic is. And I think his general premise around it was that we live in a 3D world, right? We live in a world where, you know, we kind of build up and we build across sort of thing. So we can kind of get more people into... We can kind of get more people into less square footage of a building. Think of a skyscraper. You can fit a lot of people in there because they just keep going up and up and up and up. But we don't necessarily do that with our transport system. Our transport system is still 2D. So the only way we can kind of get more cars on the road is by making more, um, basically, lanes, right, that cars can drive on. But then that requires you to have more space. And there's not enough, there's not that much space in LA for the most part. And in general, you're, gonna, you're always going to get traffic jams. But with tunnels... Um, that go underneath you can always build tunnels on top of each other and, and across each other like how you do on, on most underground systems right the tunnels are kind of going underneath over blah 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 so the whole idea behind the whole um the whole idea with the boring company was that for the most popular for the most like popular trips or whatever it may be point to point trips there'll be a tunnel that will take you from one place to the other really quickly right the, that was a general premise of it and that would eventually ease some traffic and um i think the the first iteration of it was that the cars would uh you'd kind of get you kind of drive your car up to like a sort of like loading bay sort of thing like a designated bay and then your car would lower down uh an escalator and you kind of sit on a little electric tray that would then zip you around the tunnels on the ground and then once you get to your destination your car would enter up another elevator elevator come back up onto up onto the ground floor and you can drive along to your your journey so essentially you're not taking up any extra room you're just using the kind of roads that are around and you're just building really small tunnels and obviously you can then build your own little mini buses your kind of um tesla mini buses that could also take people down there that could keep going around and around and around in circles which eventually would ease some traffic on the roads in general um and then the kind of idea sort of developed a little bit more and now what we have is the following from the boring company 
Uh, da, 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 da. We now have this, which is kind of, it's sort of like changed somewhat a little bit now. So you don't have the electric trays anymore. What they now have is like, they have these little uh, retractable wheels that come out underneath the front, underneath the front fender of the, the front bumper of the car that can be attached, I think, for a couple of hundred dollars, I think um, Elon Musk said. But I think the evolution of it so far, which I've heard, it's not going to be, it's only for electric cars, EVs, electric vehicles. Um, of course, for the general reason behind it is because of the pollution, if you had um, diesel cars in there, whatever it may be. And... Um, so you're going to be so you have to fit these little wheels in underneath the the front bumper that kind of extend out and then they act like tracks that kind of run along the side of the, um, the side of the tunnel and then the car would immediately go into autonomous mode i'm assuming and that would activate and it'll kind of zip around the tunnel really, really quickly at set speed slow down go up let's elevate and go back up but the presentation was the other day and it looked fucking incredible man so 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 cool and i'm going to quickly play this now to show you So says, uh, the Boring Company Tunnel is a construction company founded by Musk in 2016. Its goal is to ease traffic jams by building large tunnels beneath cities to hold transportation systems. Uh, the, the Boring Company Hawthorn Tunnel Test Tunnel stretches uh, 1.14 miles long and costs $10 million to construct and will only clean, and only clean uh, zero emission vehicles. Benefits of the tunnel includes travel speeds of up to 150 miles per hour, with weatherproof commuting and unlimited layers of tunnels that can be stacked underground. Amazing, isn't it? So cool. Due to high demand, tours are scheduled by invite only. So I think that vi that kind of same vision only that we're seeing now, the car itself, like careering through a tunnel, is just fucking insane. So um, there's a lot of problems people have kind of like like you know flagged up about the whole idea in general things that aren't going to work things that will work but i think in general i think for anyone out there that's all like you know trying to do their own thing i think it's quite cool to see somebody on that level who's identified a problem and instead of complaining about it has tried to put their best foot forward and try and create a solution and that's what he's doing it might not be perfect it might be some chinks in the army he ironed out like a lot of people said this tunnel was quite claustrophobic i've seen a couple of vlogs on there uh, i think case nice that mentioned it on his um, vlog that he did of the tunnel um in general it's a little bit rough around the edges people are not just the residents that live in the area are not that happy about having tunnels dig underneath their kind of like path where their house is even though it's going to cause no disruption to where they live blah 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 there's things that need to be kind of worked out but i think the general premise of like allow you know kind of easing congestion in most cities is so so key especially if i just look at the city that i live in in london i think they're going to i think there was a, a, a drug i think i saw something the other day an initiative that they're going to want to change uh west i think central london to be a zero vehicle or no cars allowed something along those kind of lines which kind of makes a lot more sense considering you know just how jam-packed those streets are most um during most of the week especially when you include buses and you include taxis in addition to regular kind of like delivery cars and stuff it's got so bad i think i mentioned i remember seeing a, a quite ludicrous statement from um uh the mayor of london um Khan, whatever his name is, uh, says something along the lines of like, um, to, in order to ease congestion, he's hope he's hope he's uh asking people that work in offices in central London not to have their sh their goods shipped to their offices and have them sent home instead, because that's what's causing some of the uh, of the traffic because all the you know, all these kind of delivery vans all over the place. It's like, dude, come on, man, that's such a like um unsophisticated way to solve a problem and it? it's just like the, the lowest common denominator but things like this can kind of maybe ease congestion i think also the idea that we're going to have like you know there's there's days that no cars are allowed in central london they're gonna they're gonna do them quite often now i've heard as well which might also ease congestion maybe like on a sunday or something you know maybe you could just have like zero cars allowed in that sort of area um there's already the congestion charge that is it's sort of kind of a, a way to sort of like stop people coming in too often but people don't care because they need to drive so they'll pay anyway so that it worked that well i think in general um and especially with the influx of cyclists in the city it makes sense especially because there's you know there's always there's so many deaths especially on those like uh, designated cycle lanes that have been dug up by the local council and cost millions and millions of pounds to kind of do 
we still have quite a lot of deaths on those roads like cyclists get involved in accidents with cars and stuff but a lot of that would be easy if there's not, not, not so many cars on the streets in general and um, similar to kind of cities like Copenhagen right where they favour cyclists especially in the inner cities they favour cyclists maybe over cars for the most part or there's maybe a little bit more of a harmonious relationship with cars and cyclists because here it's not like that in LA it's not like that either like it's always you see videos of like car drivers shouting at people that are on bikes and stuff whatever but I thought the idea was amazing. I thought it's really cool from somebody that's kind of like, you know, had a bit of a tumultuous year, as it, as it could be said when it comes to Elon Musk. But overall, I think it's pretty cool. I'm probably going to see a lot more of the boring company doing these kind of things. Is there, an, might be an official video, actually, that they might have on there. I thought it was quite cool, him presenting the actual uh, topic itself. Where is it? Oh, it's in 11 minutes, but I'm not going to watch that whole thing, am I? That's not happening. But yeah, in general, I thought it was pretty cool. Um... The brain can't be Luke. It's here. They got a loop here. Yeah, it's a video. I'll show this. The loop. Zip. You know what I love about? It. I just love how um, I love how uh, I love how small um, the whole entire tunnel is. It's just just fit, just big enough to fit the car inside it. It doesn't need to be any more bigger than that. Um, I also just love the idea that you can just zip around the entire city. You know, from kind of major points. I think that probably be a lot better, especially considering it's on a loop. It might more make sense to have like you know further distances covered and that kind of loop system. And then maybe shorter distances maybe can be done with like, you know, trams and buses and stuff and kind of ease congestion. Because, you know, if you've ever been on a, I don't know, on a 25 bus, for instance, right, it's a good example. Um, from like Stratford to central London, it's not that bad on a day where there's not much traffic. You can probably get from Stratford to central London within an hour or maybe a little bit less than that. But when it's like, you know, when it's rush hour traffic, it's insane how long it takes like, just to get from Olgate East to like Tottenham Court Road. is just fucking a night. You might as well walk. It's just insane. So to ease that kind of congestion, it would be nice to maybe have like a system that allows cars to get from Olga East to Central London or to Tottenham Court Road really quickly through that kind of system. That would be really, really cool to see maybe happen in the future. I'm not sure if it's going to happen in general, but that would be cool to happen. Um, anyway, uh, that is an hour, you know. That's a one hour. They're done. And I've only covered maybe three or four topics here that I haven't wanted to get into. But, you know, there's, tomorrow is another day. There's always more time to talk about things. For now, I shall leave you because I have to go ahead and get ready for my DJ set later on tonight. It's actually come up here on the old RA. Um, I need to kind of get my music sorted out, get my playlist all that done, all that nice stuff. So I'll leave you for now. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Agnes Zinger Show, episode number 134. It's been a pleasure to share the airwaves and the YouTube channels and the podcast platforms with you. Um, if you're watching through the YouTube, of course, give me a like as per usual, you know, you know, to kind of make people aware of this stuff. Click on subscribe if you like what I'm talking about. You want to see my ugly face again uh, for everyone who's on the podcast. Thanks a lot for tuning in. It's been an amazing podcast as per usual. I like talking and rambling and saying nonsensical stuff. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace.